Okay, we're going to play. Good introduction. We're going to play. Mm -hmm. Now, I must share something with you first. When I was asked to give a series of talks, I wrote down on a piece of paper all the things that are, I find interesting and that I reflect on. And that's why I chose these subjects. You might say they're in the process of reflecting. So I thought if I chose these subjects, since I enjoy reflecting on them, it would be an easy task to give a talk on them. But I hadn't anticipated this particular evening's assignment, which is the tragic in the comic and the comic in the tragic. It's a real, very interesting problem. I'd like to share first with you why I think it's so interesting and maybe most important. First, In the description of tonight's talk, there includes a line that we're going to be dealing with Plato's dialogue, the symposium. You see, here's Plato, great philosopher. And the conclusion of this dialogue, which has many, many humorous comic scenes in it, he concludes the entire dialogue with this statement. Now, what's surprising about that is why a philosopher would ever be interested in comedy and why tragedy? Maybe the tragic, but not the comic. Another thing, it is a well-known thesis that if you take any dialogue and structure it out, you'll find that the introduction anticipates the entire dialogue and the conclusion always brings you to reflect in an interesting way on the entire dialogue so you're forced to see it in a new way. Now, given that, how can this in any way cause us to reflect on the dialogue in a new way? Doesn't appear to have anything to do with philosophy, just tragedy and comedy. Let's take a look at it. Socrates was compelling them, that's Agathon and Aristophanes. And as you know, Agathon just won first prize for writing tragedies. And Aristophanes is the great comic poet. And they both gained great fame in their respective fields. So Socrates is compelling them to admit that the same man ought to understand how to compose both comedy and tragedy. Evidently, they didn't want to admit that, or at least one of them didn't, since he had to compel them to admit it. Then there's the second part, and that he who has skill as a tragic poet has skill for a comic poet. Well, the person who has the skill for a tragic poet, that's very clear. That is Agathon. He won first prize. Obvious. So therefore, that he who has skill as a tragic poet, Agathon, has skill for a comic poet. Well, why would he be reluctant to admit that unless there was something about what he said in the dialogue or the speech that he gave in the dialogue that was such a failure that it justified Socrates' comment? Well, what would that be? Look here. If, if they both agreed readily to this, then Agathon then should have written then or composed or gave a great speech on love. That was tragic or comic since obviously the same person should have both skills. 
but he was opposing it. Well, look here. Since he gave a comic speech, since he gave a comic speech, perhaps there's something about the comic speech he gave which in principle showed that he failed to understand what he was doing. Well, that would mean, by the way, if this is sound, that he's not a tragic poet either. If the requirement of a tragic poet, someone who has skill for it, is that they should also be able to do the work of a comic poet. So if that's correct, then uh, we might understand why Socrates is described in the article, in the dialogue, as not having attended the great festival and celebration of Agathon's winning the first prize for tragedies. But what has this got to do with philosophy? Let me take the other side, Aristophanes. The same man, either one, ought to understand how to compose both. Just ought to understand, not do it. Not that they have the skill to do it, they simply ought to understand how to do both. Well, if that applies to Aristophanes, and he gave a very, what appears to be a very funny speech about the nature of love, well, perhaps there's something weak about the way he expressed his comedy. Well, or, it could be that when he was writing and giving that great speech, he mixed tragic elements with comic elements, and he should not have done he should not have done that. He ought to know how to compose. He ought to know how to compose, and he should have avoided that kind of situation. But what has this got to do with philosophy? Is it? Well, look here. Let me go another step. They're all sitting around. Everyone is, at this point, it's the end of the evening, end of the dialogue. They're all sitting in a circle, going from left to right. End of the evening, there are only three people left. All the others either passed out from drinking too much or left. And there are only three people left. And they are going around from left to right, still obeying the basic rule of the dialogue that speeches should proceed from left to right, and they're continuing to drink. And therefore, here is the comic writer, composer, here's the tragic, and here's the philosopher. Does that suggest, therefore, that we might have something like this? How would you arrange a comic figure a tragic figure, a philosopher. Are they progressive steps? How should they be arranged? Oh, wait a minute, let's go another step. When you have three terms like this, they can be arranged in a mean proportion. So it could very well be that we might say comedy is to tragedy as tragedy is to philosophy. That would be a mean, a mean analogy of three terms. A comedy is to tragedy, as a tragedy is to philosophy. Now, why would he be expressing that kind of analogy, and what's so significant about that? Well, here's another problem. Very curious problem. If you look up comedy, if you look up comedy in an index on Carl Jung's works, you won't find any reference to comedy. If you look up the references to Manley Hall and many a philosopher, you won't find any references to comedy. How, why did the Greeks generate these two things? They also generated this. Is there some interconnection between comedy, tragedy, and philosophy, which the Greeks were able to see and represent with great clarity? And furthermore, is it possible that Socrates 
playing the role that he's playing in this curious dialogues that Plato called the symposium, does that represent the whole problem of the relationship between comedy, tragedy, and philosophy? Well, if so, how are we going to express it? How are we going to explore it? Well, there are many people who are into this curious game of the spiritual evolution of man, east and west. And they don't deal with comic and the tragic. They ignore it. It's not relevant. Or if it is relevant, then why don't they deal with it? Or don't they see it? If Plato is saying that they're interrelated, then if they don't really grasp one, they don't grasp the other. For the same man ought to understand how, how to compose comedy, tragedy, and philosophy. And he who has skill as a philosopher, should he also have skill for writing tragedies and comedies? Now that would be an irony, would it not? Hmm, liquor. Let's, let's look at it in another way. In the Greek world, those who designed the comedies, as you know, they performed between the second and the third drama in a trilogy, sometimes called satyr plays. That's where we get the idea of comic relief. So if you went to see three plays in the evening between the second and the third, that would slip in a comedy. The comedies were always surprises. For many, many years, no record was made of them. They put them on, everyone laughed, had a good time with them, and they passed into oblivion. They didn't keep records of them. They didn't keep records of them until very late. Furthermore, they weren't giving prizes for comedies, but they gave prizes for tragedies until very late. Now, what is it about a comedy? Look here, maybe we can set up a little interesting table. And then, if we can read something out of Plato's Symposium in respect to Aristophanes and Agathon and Socrates, we may be able to pull something together. Now, let's go one more step. Comedy for the Greeks was a time to let go. That's when they got rid of all their inhibitions and they had a good time doing it. Boisterous, satyr plays. Therefore, they always made fun of, made a comedy out of sexuality. Authorities. And ideally, they'd love to re relate them together. A satyr play is a sexual farce. Unhid uninhibited sexual freedom on stage in public was a satyr play, and that was the, the center part of a comedy in those days. It's really worth noting that if you go downstairs to our bookstore here, or the library, and you work your way through all of the shelves and open them up, books on the shelves, and look up comedy, there are going to be very few books on comedy. There are going to be very few people who are going to deal with comedy. Well, therefore, it seems curious that we want to say they're related, especially this way. So let's try it and see what we can come up with. First, would you agree that they all deal with the same problem? They all deal because sexuality is just a physical expression of love. Comedy deals with sexuality, love. Tragedy invariably has to deal with problems of love. Philosophy, that's very name, deals with problems of love. 
Wow. Suppose then we take a look at a comic figure. Now, Aristophanes had Socrates in his play, The Clouds, suspended from the heavens in a basket. And he put him up there because he was close to heaven. And therefore, he made a comic figure out of him. What is it about making a comic figure about the highest authorities, love and sexuality? Well, let us take the central notion first. Think of any comic, any comedy at all. Would you agree they have a certain appearance necessary appearance. They have a certain style. They enter into all kinds of conflict situations. And when they do that, they always think they know. They believe they know. They never question what they know. Never question. And because they never question, they believe that they know, they get in the most amazing situations, which they never solve, which they never solve, but they stumble their way through it. The solutions to every comic story cannot be the, re the result of the comic waking up and dealing directly with a puzzling situation he created through his own ignorance. So then, the interesting thing about a comedy is that he doesn't know it, but we in the audience know. We are playing a major role in the comedy. We're the audience. We know. We're in on it. We can laugh at him or her. The comic figure, he believes he knows. We know he doesn't know. And therefore, we can laugh at his ignorance. The comic figure, therefore, always functions on two levels. That is to say, he is always ignorant and he always has a belief, and the belief that he has or she has is that they really know. So they're in two realms, ignorance and belief. Now, the, the situations they get into because they believe they know, but they are in truth ignorant, can then be characterized. We can take sexual scenes. We can take authority scenes and we have everything we need to start a comic scene. Now look here, let's leave that for a moment. Look here, how does the tragic figure compare? He doesn't appear comic, he has to be serious. No laughs are permitted in a tragedy. Now look here. We, too, play a critical role in a tragedy. Because we know he doesn't know something very important about himself. The whole drama of a tragedy is that in the beginning he never questions either. He never questions, assumes absolutely that he's right, acts knowingly, tries to deal intelligently with a situation. That's his mark. Attempts, right? Attempts to deal 
with the chaos around has a very keen mind but doesn't realize that the chaos is a direct result of his own ignorance of himself. Right. It's based upon his own ignorance of himself. How do they differ? It's in the mark of a tragedy that he finally has to face the ignorance that he has of himself. He has to challenge his beliefs that he knows. Circumstances have to be brought up to challenge the belief that he knows until finally he has to recognize that he is in fact ignorant. Now what kind of ignorance is it Let's skip it and go back to it. Look here, the philosopher. We'll call the philosopher the Socratic figure for a moment. All right. The Socratic figure. He always questions whatever it is he discovers that he believes. Right here, always questions. what he believes. The chaos around him is not based upon his own ignorance. There's just a chaos around him and he's only interested in gaining an insight in the chaos within himself. The tragedian, the tragedian, finally has to question what he believes, just like the philosopher. He then has to see that the chaos around him really comes out of himself, therefore he's very similar to a philosopher. The difference, however, is that the ignorance that the tragedian has is an ignorance of facts that he should have known but didn't. They're always facts. Oedipus. He didn't realize that the woman he married that was twice his age, it never occurred to him that phys physiologically in terms of age, she could have been his mother. He never once does that. He never once questions it until finally the tragedy unfolds and he's forced to look at it. But in any case, it's a fact. That's what he doesn't know, a fact. Agamemnon, when he returns home, he never once dealt with the fact that his wife ought to be upset because he sacrificed his own daughter in order to get the fleet and the, the maritime expedition to engage Troy because that sacrifice he thought then would end the plague from Apollo. He just forgot that small, small little fact. He didn't deal with it. He didn't prepare for it. They're facts. They're historical material. Now look here. When the philosopher plays this game, he realizes his ignorance of himself but it's not based upon facts. It's a very fundamental kind of ignorance. And the only way in which he can remedy that is to discover that the beliefs he has, the beliefs that he possesses, are the very things that obscure his vision of himself. And the chaos in himself is nothing other than the competing effects of different beliefs in his own soul. Now, let's try something. Let's see if we can put a few more things in here. 
if the comic figure reduces love to sexuality, then by necessity, beauty cannot play a role in the story. Satisfaction will, sexual release will, beauty will not. Equally well, happiness, a very important element, must be missing because of the same reason. The only happiness that the comic figure is going to pursue is that he's going to look upon it as pleasure. And all of the conflicts involving pleasure. So he's going to ignore beauty, he's going to ignore beauty, and simply reduce it to sexual attraction. Fleeting, coming and going. Now, oh. the tragedian is going to be serious. He's going to view these things, but he too is not going to play too much concern with this idea of beauty and happiness. I don't care, why is that? Because he only has one quest to solve the chaos around him. And if something is beautiful, whether it's a Helen, whether it's a Penelope, doesn't matter. He is directly responsible, he feels, for chaos. He wants to find out why it exists, and he's going to do something about it. That's his major goal. Chaos is ugly. Chaos is ugly, is discordant, is disordered. It's the opposite. That's what the tragedian is focusing on, the opposite of beauty. As for happiness, his happiness will come only when he's successful. Therefore, the tragedian doesn't pursue happiness, he pursues success. The beauty that he, he doesn't pursue beauty, he wants to reduce chaos to order. And there is his love. Order and success. As for the comedian and the comic figure, sexual attraction and pleasure. Now, in the philosopher's game, there is one basic belief, and that is that there really is such a thing as beauty. It exists in its own right, and the perception of it brings happiness, and it's that for the sake of which all the struggles man goes through reaches its fulfillment. For the philosopher, there is chaos, disorder, but he would call it appearance. And he would look beyond appearance for a reality. He wants to go through the appearance, both of himself and the nature of, of what we experience, and go through that, penetrate that some way, have it disclosed in some way, that there is something that is fundamentally real, that is both beautiful and bestows upon the person who grasps it, the realization of the goal of life. That is happiness. So they all deal with the same things in different ways. Would you not agree the tragedian is relentless in his pursuit? He is going to find out why this chaos exists, and if necessary, he's going to find it in himself and even punish himself. He's going to take on all the roles of the detective and the judge and the sentencer, all within himself. He's driven by success, even if he becomes the victim. 
That's what he's driven by. That's what that's what that's what he focuses on. But there's something missing, you see, in the tragedian. That he doesn't see behind the order and success, there is a higher degree of beauty and happiness. And he never comes to close, never comes to grips with that. The comic figure doesn't know it. Therefore, we could restructure this this way, right? We could say, there's ignorance, there's belief, there's understanding, there's knowing. And now, we can now put some things along this and see what we have. He's ignorant of beauty. No beauty. Uh, most important, no happiness. There's a reduction to the absurd. There is no love because there is no fundamental pursuit of beauty. There is no love. And the audience know and can laugh at his ignorance and for a short while feel superior. That mighty feeling. He certainly has a belief. As we said, he never questions that he believes he knows. Never solves any problems. Problems persist. He stumbles his way through them in an amazing sort of way. But it can't be resolved. The problems can't be resolved by any insight on his part because he doesn't know. He's ignorant. Therefore, he functions on these two levels. Now notice, we can use the same language now with the tragedian. He too, he too, the tragedian. We're going to call this then the comic figure. Well, he doesn't grasp beauty and happiness, as we said. Love, these are not in his realm. He doesn't reduce things to the absurd. He reduces things to, reduces things to the need for order and success. And remember we said he thinks he knows the, the comic figure. The tragedian, he thinks he knows. He has to go through a transition. He must go through a transition. He has to go then from ignorance to understand that he is the cause of the chaos. We knew it all along. We're in the audience. We are amazed at his integrity, his fortitude, dedication, as he peels away levels and levels of ignorance. And therefore, he becomes a very interesting figure for us to contemplate. We know what he doesn't know. We puzzle at the depth of his ignorance because ignorance locks him into his belief structure, which causes him the great turmoil of his life. So we know. We don't laugh at his ignorance. Right? 
we shed tears, right? We empathize with the price we see of ignorance. It's a special kind of ignorance. Remember what we said? Ignorance of oneself, but not of the self, of some facts about the self. So therefore, he grows. He's capable of growth. Now, it looks like, therefore, he is not ignorant in this sense, and therefore, the tragedian can be placed right in here. Overlaps. Well, it's necessary that from what we said that the philosopher recognizes his ignorance, is relentless in his pursuit of eliminating the elimination of false beliefs, not factual data, but false beliefs about the nature of reality and himself. Therefore, he's going to go through quite a transition. You see, he starts out with ignorance. He then questions his beliefs. He then has to discover a proper, correct understanding of both the self and the nature of reality. And then he finally has to try to discover it for himself by direct experience. And therefore, he grows through all four stages. He goes through all four stages. Now, let me give you a problem here. Why does it follow that if you have an understanding of the nature of reality, and even have an experience of the nature of reality, that in any way that's equivalent to gaining an insight into the self? Why should there be any relationship between the two? Why does it follow that if some philosopher contemplates the nature of reality. There he is, contemplating the nature of reality. Right. Why does it follow that if he does get an insight into the nature of reality, that, in, that, that simultaneously gives him an insight into the nature of the soul? Furthermore, let's put in now the other part of the riddle. We are the audience for Plato's dialogues. We don't know, we don't know what he knows. We don't go through these st stages and these transitions unless we become the philosopher. We can't be in the audience. These two need an audience. This, you can't be in the audience. You can't be passive. You either engage in it or you're out. You can recognize Socrates' early days as being ignorant. You can see he challenges belief. You can even go through some of the same things that he understands. But only man, by himself and alone, does this perceives into the nature of reality. Now, I thought I'd read now a couple of things interesting about Aristophanes, Agathon, and Socrates, just to see whether we can make a couple of points. Now, the first one is, there's something about the tragedian and the comic figure and a comic writer 
They both have beliefs, <coughs> major beliefs. And the major belief they both share is that that level of knowing is not possible. That's what they agree to. No. Aristophanes has that great story, as you undoubtedly recall, that in the early days, mankind was not as we are now, but composed of two-headed figures and four arms and four legs. And we were so powerful, we decided then to attack heaven, try to get into heaven, which some people are still trying to do today. Zeus, therefore, thinking that they were very powerful and nearly succeeded, decided that he was going to remedy this. And his remedy was very important because, after all, if he could make more of them, there would be more sacrifices and that would please him. So he decided just to cut them right down the middle. Turn the heads around. And in that way, being successful, smoothed out the skin and the stomach area, used a smooth instrument, left a couple of wrinkles on the belly just as a reminder. And now, once split, man continually sought his other half. And the other half are in three sexes. Male, male, female, female, male, female. Well, as you know, according to the story, the human race nearly expired because when they met their other half, they'd embrace, but nothing happened since the sexual parts were on the outside. So Zeus had to com come up with another miracle and he turned around the sexual part so they could then enter one another and be satisfied and then go on and do other things in life. Therefore, love is nothing other than the power of getting back to your original shape. So therefore, now, he then has to deal with what happens when you do get your other half. And this is where he loses it because he says, all of this going on as it is, it's not a sensual union that drives people together, but something else, and they don't know what it is. They're puzzled and bewildered about what it is that drives them. And therefore, they have a profound mystery of why they are together and what they expect to get from one another. Uh-oh, mystery, problem, how will he solve it? Remember, he can't solve it. There has to be a way in which it is solved for him. He can't solve it by recourse to understanding or knowing. Well, there they are then, they're brought together. And he has this great section where he uses the if hypothetical. What would happen if Hephaestus came along, the great god that the, the maker in the heavens, were to weld them together? Well, I imagine that those two people who were brought together in one of these combinations would think they're getting what they have always wanted. But the mystery remains, the mystery remains. They don't know what they can expect to get from other, one another. And so when they go down and end their lives and go into the next world, they are still welded together. And they still have no solution to their problem. The story is turning tragic. He lost the comic aspect to it. How will he resolve it? He resolves it in a very interesting way. See whether it's a solution, though. The way to make our race happy, happiness, is to make love perfect and each to get his very own beloved and go back to our original nature. But when we had our original nature, we stormed heaven. His solution of being happy then is to go back to our original nature. He says, but if this is the best thing possible, the best thing to our hand must, of course, be to come as near it as possible. 
and that is to get a beloved that suits our mind. Mm -mm. There's no place for mind in this whole system. Therefore, he lost his ability to resolve his comedy in a comic situation. He then moved upwards and reached for something because there's nothing in the story that prepares someone to seek someone who suits their own mind. All he did was present a model for sexual combinations and there is no role for mind in the whole story. Again, there's no reference to beauty in the whole thing and his whole idea is that man will become happy when he makes perfect love by getting his proper half back together again. But would you not agree then, if he gets back to where he was before, he would then be once again strong enough to storm heaven. That means that Aristophanes' view of love, the origin of love, is a punishment. Love is a punishment because that's what Zeus did. It's that split that produced love, that desire to regain our whole, our unity. His unity, therefore, is a physical unity. It has nothing to do with the higher end, end essence of unifying oneself and the difficulties one has within oneself. It's purely physical. So therefore, his story fits exactly what we've been talking about here. We have fun reading it, we can enjoy it, but we know in the end that he wasn't able to maintain that theme to the end. Agathon. Agathon, the great tragedian. In his whole speech, Agathon starts out by saying that he is going to talk about the nature of the God because he calls love a God. And he's not going to talk about God, not the things, you're not going to praise him for the things that we receive from him, the gifts, but what he causes. Of course, he doesn't keep that. So he starts his speech by saying, I say then that all gods are happy, not man, all gods are happy. I'm skipping. Oh, no, I won't. Okay, I'll continue it. I say then that all gods are happy, but it, but it is lawful to say this without offense. I say that love is the happiest of them all, being most beautiful and best. Right. So therefore, love is right, beautiful and best. Now, He's now going to try to give a proof for that. Well, he doesn't give one word for proof. He says one proof is, is that the uh, God of love must be the youngest. And the great proof is that uh, he flies away from old age. His idea of love is that love hates old age. He says, love is very much like eight, A-T-E, Homer's view. He says, you know, I want to talk about the God's tenderness. He says, I should describe eight. She was a God and tender. And the proof is that tender are her feet. She comes not near the ground, but walks upon the heads of men. And uh, that's his... his move to humor. Tender are her feet because she doesn't walk on the ground but walks upon the heads of men. He said, I think he gives good proof of her tenderness that she walks not on the hard but on the soft. Then let us use the same proof for love. So it turns out to be comic. But you see, when a tragedian goes comic, he then has to go down. He has to give up understanding. And he has to present these two. That's what the comic is. 
comic writer is there. Therefore, when the tragedian moves into comedy, he goes down into his art and has to give up understanding. No. Socrates, on the other hand, for Socrates and philosophy, it's essential that contemplation plays a major role, as it does in Socrates' speech. You have to contemplate the nature of beauty. And then in a sudden experience, one beholds a beauty marvelous in its nature. That beauty, marvelous in its nature, he calls the perfection of beauty. It's the perfection of beauty. It's the perfection of beauty. What does it do to the person then who gains it? There in life and there alone, my dear Socrates, is life worth living for man while he contemplates beauty itself. That is therefore a beauty happiness, the end of life. This is what life is about. And uh, this is why life is worth living for man, because it's possible to experience that. Therefore, since this beauty is so staggering in its, in its glow and its, uh, the experience of it, there has to be a love for it once it's then glimpsed because love is awakened when you see something beautiful. When everything you see is beautiful, you're going to wake up to it. If you wake up to it, that's love, because the desire for the beautiful is love. Therefore, the nature of reality is beauty itself in the Platonic world. That's the experience, beauty in itself. But this doesn't help us in any way, because it doesn't help us with our problem. Remember our early problem? Why does it follow that if you do experience this beauty, which is an insight into the nature of the real, do you not reflect that there only it will be possible for him when he sees the beautiful with the mind which alone can see it? to give birth not to likenesses of excellence or virtue, since he touches no likeness, but to reality, since he touches reality. Well, okay. Then the nature of that experience called the perfection of beauty is an insight into the nature of reality. That reality, therefore, is perceived only by the mind only. It is a knowing. This then becomes the model for knowing. It can't be seen by the audience. They can hear about it. Therefore, we can stand as an audience in awe of another's growth and development. And gives us a hint as to our own goal. Now, there is something comic about the philosopher. Every philosopher has something comic about them. Because there is a chaos around them. Because they're not spending their time making sure that the world is ordered and successful, I mean, that's just the way it is. They're doing something else, and therefore they have to pay for that. Therefore, there's always a conflict between the tragedian and the philosopher, because the tragedian can never understand why it is that the philosopher would allow a certain kind of disorder to exist around him. In Socrates' case, he knows that. He says, yeah, that's true. That's what happens. That's right. 
I heard her cry. That's what happens. And therefore, there's always a difficulty for these two types to mingle. But look at it the other way. The philosopher had to start out ignorant, a comic figure. He had to discover the beliefs that he had. Therefore, he had to move out of being a comic figure into a tragic figure until finally he reaches the knowing state. And to go through that, he has to take another look at his own sexuality, beauty, mind, love, perfection, in an entirely different way. The only way he can do it is by trying to understand going backwards. It's from this experience that he can then understand that what he formerly thought either aided him, helped him gain this vision or not. Therefore, it's always a return backwards and restating what it was that allowed this vision to take place. Therefore, a higher kind of understanding emerges from the philosopher. The beliefs that he now has, in the same way, are the kinds of beliefs that can only be confirmed in that kind of vision. The kind of ignorance that he now has is a different kind of ignorance. Because in the everyday way of looking at knowledge, this is not knowing. It's not an object of knowledge as understood by any one of these three systems. You can even call it a divine ignorance an agnostic, a, a non-knowing. Now, it didn't help us a bit. Why does it follow that if someone has an experience of the nature of reality, perfection of beauty, with the mind, beatific vision, why would anyone want to say it discloses something about the nature of the self? And uh, I'd like to read one line out of Plato's dialogue, <clears throat> the Alcibiades, which a friend of mine translated. This is Alcibiades 132C. And next, what way do we turn, wishing to know this most brilliantly? Since when we know this appropriately, we will know ourselves also. With the gods present, do we not understand the well-said Delphic inscription, which we recall just now? With what intention do you say such a thing, Socrates, says Alcibiades? Socrates comes back and says, I will declare what I at least suspect this inscription means and the advice. As knowing this thing which is most brilliant. For if you know that, then you know ourselves also or we know ourselves also. That's Plato. Because there aren't two things, the self and reality. The reality of the self and the self of reality is the same thing. Now, why that is, is a delicious thing to wonder about. Therefore, it justifies the quest for a vision of reality justifies the quest for knowing yourself. It justifies the quest for beauty and the perfection of beauty. It justifies, therefore, a love for it and a way of then getting out of one's own belief structures to understand a way to achieve it. And when that's culminated in a vision, a contemplation of knowing, then one knows oneself. Therefore, 
The philosopher, therefore, moves from a comic figure to a tragic figure to himself as he proceeds through each of these. Because then he learns something new about himself he could never have guessed. It's not a fact, so he goes beyond the tragedy in. He goes beyond the comic figure, obviously. And rather than reduce things to the absurd, he raises things to the highest value. And therefore he culminates those three things, the comic, the tragic, into philosophy. And therefore, would you not agree that in that experience you have to let go of both what you understand and believe. And that letting go in utter freedom can be represented as a satyr play on the physical level or as the tragic figure in the conclusion when he has to let go of everything and accepts himself for what he is, the cause of his own disaster. And therefore, tragedy, comedy, and philosophy play have an intimate role to play among themselves, back and forth. And therefore, I would say we need more comedies in life. Satyr plays, and especially sexuality, in a noble way of representing the comic aspect of man. Because when you take the bottom level as real, you're a comic figure yourself, which we are. We're all three. So thank you. That's what I wanted to do. And I'll hear anything you have, so long as you start it with a joke. <laughs> so we'll have prizes given to the best Seder play next month. Thank you. What was the authorities, um, was that uh, an additional element to the Seder play? The sexuality and yes. authoritarian is yes. or something? Yes, they have to be um, officious people, uh -huh. right? who are caught in certain scenes, you know, with erections and things like that, and nudity, and, yeah. Because then you take something that's regarded with a certain reverence or, or respect, and then you show the other side of it, which is the comic side of it, which is the everyday. And so therefore it has all of those common things that make us chuckle and make fun of our own illusions. Well, it seems like in our <clears throat> politics we have that Yes, yes, we have some of it in, in yeah. politics only. Yeah, yeah. Doonesbury. <coughs> right, he's, he's good at that, yeah. Mm. But, uh, see, we made, in our, our, this culture that we have, we, we, we can't face comedies based upon sexuality because there's so much guilt and, and uh, judgments made about even discussing and portraying sexuality, that it's difficult to, to kind of, in all fairness, to try to establish some fair view of it. Like from, uh, scholars know that there's whole warehouses full of pornographic art sculpting. In the Greek world, that's basically kept in warehouses um, our culture is heavily in influenced by its roots, Christianity, Judaism. And therefore, it, we, we, we can't face that letting go the way those, those people did in that age. And also, by the way, they, of course, added to it uh, wine and... and the whole comedy of life, they wanted to turn everything, let go, of, let go of everything, let go of everything. Maximize letting go as a comedy. Show it in its most brutal form, its comic form, foolish form. That is to show the foolishness of everyday life. Which it is, right? Yeah.
So the relationship between comic and philosopher is that uh, the philosopher is in the states that the comic has well, been in and I takes himself out of that? Well, there are two, two levels. One is that um, from an audience viewpoint, you can certainly portray a philosopher in a comic situation. Right? Because they don't have the same values, their judgments are foolish, they're not wise, they're not based upon models of success necessarily, or most often not. So they can be good objects of humor. I make fun of them. I, I think so. I think they're very funny myself. Socrates is funny. I mean, he's a comic figure. Isn't he? It'd be simple to make fun of him. And they did. Yeah. The other way we're talking about it, though, goes this way. That in the beginning of uh, in the symposium, Socrates describes his own views about the nature of love. And he had to recognize that, they were, that he was ignorant. He had to realize that the beliefs that he had formed were all based upon illusion. He then had to then learn right opinions about it. Then he had to discover why those opinions were right. That's understanding. And he then had to have a confirming vision of that. And until he had a confirming vision of it, he just understood he didn't know. And that's the game. And I got my way through this whole thing without telling one joke. Can I have one? Just to solemnize the evening? <laughs> put me on the spot. Hmm? I said, put me on the spot. Of course, of course. <laughs> Do you have one? A favorite one? Everyone has a favorite joke. I have one, but it's not. A, not I have not one. A, oh, go ahead. It's, it's the role of the St. Peter joke. Oh, well, that's because you come from a very rich and holy tradition. <laughs> well, rich in a you sense of. That one or? Yes, uh, okay. St. Peter. Well, um, there was this priest that died and went up to heaven and was in line and there was a taxi guy in front of him, a taxi driver. And uh, the taxi driver, uh, St. Peter asked him, what did you do in line? He says, well, I was a taxi driver. And so St. Peter gives him a gold cloth scepter that was gold. It was really, sent him on to a real fine area of heaven. So the priest is sitting there saying, wow, I know what I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to really, you know, I mean, if that guy gets that stuff, I know where I'm going to be. You know, probably the left hand of God or, you know, whatever. So the um, St. Peter says, what would you do? And he says, well, I was a priest. So he gives him this kind of raggedy old cloth, a wood scepter. And the guy said, wait a minute, I'm a priest. What am I getting this for? That guy, look at what he got. He said, yeah, every time you give a speech, you put everybody to sleep. But when you get into a tax man, you know, they, everybody starts praying. We want results. See? <laughs> See? We're good at humor, so we're good at jokes. But we, our people don't write these, can't write these kinds we of comedies. Can't do this. No. 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 Um, so you mean that that the Seder plays? Do we have any Seder plays? Mm -hmm. Which ones? How many do we have? I don't recall. I, I, we, we don't have Seder. We just have stories of them. So we don't have they, any examples? None of them were ever, no one ever preserved any of them. Really? Each time they gave them it was ideally to be a total surprise and not to be done again since it was supposed to be a total surprise. Therefore, they didn't record them, even though some of them were said to have been hilarious. I was just wondering if Lysistrata would be on the level of a 
close to a Seder plate because it, it is my, just my, hilarious. Yeah, yeah. And if that would represent what you would consider to be the comedy of in terms of sexuality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if that's the case, and I can see how mm. that how this joke that I just gave compared to yeah. that play, well, it is uh, certainly uh, remarkable. I mean, they use sexuality yeah. in a in a noble way. Yeah. The women did. Yeah. And yet, yeah. there was a lot of lightness about it too. Mm. Oh, I got one for you. That's, uh, Good. Thank you. There's these two guys in New York City, and they're in front of this big giant Catholic church. Mm -hmm. Giving away this muck out of the sewer across the street. All of a sudden, this big, giant, huge limo caddy pulls up in front of the Catholic Church. All, and all this splendor out and gets the car to push. He's got a prostitute with him. And uh, this guy in the sewer calls up, Hey, Cardinal Cushing, can you drive that hard on through the eye of the needle? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. 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 We, you know, it's a... Uh... <laughs> so they weren't preserved. Oh, that's... No, they didn't preserve them. It wasn't until very late that uh, we had any records of them. Is there any idea or record of what they may have been like? Somebody talked about it? Well, I have a volume of, on Dionysius, which I'm more than willing to pass around, and uh, they describe. Some of them. Yeah, yeah. How, how about Solomon Rushdie's work, that one for which he was to be killed? Isn't that a. Oh, that's, a, that's wonderful. That's I mean, wonderful. There are authorities falling from heaven yeah. to this guy. And yeah, that's moving in that direction, isn't it? Yes, I think you're. Yeah. What is yeah. this? Which one is it? I forgot what it's called. Satanic verses. Satanic verses. Yeah. Yeah. And also, there's another one that was r okay. quite remarkable that I was trying to find for tonight, but uh, someone borrowed it and I didn't write down who it was. So. What? Yeah. What about satanic verses? It was an example of a, perhaps an example of a state of comedy. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. Which is sexuality. Oh. Mm -hmm. Good. So Clinton's got the big, bigger political heart on in this election, is that right? Yeah. Because he cares about people? Yeah. So is that because he cares about people? Is that a, is that a <laughs> well, you see, um, you have to do, you have to, see, we tell jokes, stories with punchlines. Uh -huh. They develop a, a whole story around, around life and, and sexuality vividly. So. so you could actually do a Seder play on Clinton and Dolan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, that's what they would do. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the closest is Lysistrata in terms of the Greeks. I mean, I, if that's the case, that is a whole story. Yeah, it has to be a whole story. It has yes. to have a plot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You see, Aristophanes' is is play. It's See, yeah, Aristophanes showed that he didn't have the talent. And Socrates, therefore, was quite right. Because if we're going back to it, just to make sure we pull it together. See? Agathon's speech was just, it, you could call it ludicrous. It had no plot. It had no theme. It didn't deal with any story. There is no development. Agathon, uh, pardon me, Aristophanes' speech, which appeared to be a comedy, was in fact tragic. He couldn't stay with his conclusion. He couldn't develop his conclusion. He gave it up with the solution that the way out of man's, the way out of our problem is to find a beloved who suits our own mind. That was nothing involved in the story. It didn't grow out of the story. It wasn't part of it. He ends up with the lover and the beloved going on for the rest of their existence, maybe even into the next world, with a profound mystery and, and, and inability to understand themselves. So his comedy ends up as a tragedy. Therefore, Socrates, we do not agree, 
it's quite right to compel them to admit that they don't know what they're doing. That is, that they are ignorant. And if they are then ignorant, they may then see what kinds of beliefs were responsible for their fiasco. And if that's possible, they may then rise to the occasion of getting a better understanding of these ideas. And ideally, the comic figure might be able to move to a tragic, and the tragic might be able to get close to philosophy, which he did. He tried a bit, and therefore there is that possibility, and that's what pulls them together. So, thank you.